We're going to be in two places in your Bibles today. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Acts for just a moment, and then in 1 Thessalonians. So you might want to get your thumb in one of those places. You'll see that I've got this uh, particular one titled, Meet the Thessalonians. We're going we're gonna to meet some friends. We're going to meet actually some brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, one day it'll be exciting to actually meet them, I do suppose. But as we do that, let me ask you this question. If someone were introduced to you and your family, that's important. Remember, not just you, you got to let your family be introduced to but what impressions would they walk away with? If they met your family, what impressions would they walk away with? For instance, would they walk away from meeting you and your family and say, well, that's a pretty loving family. I've got one of the guys that I work with. It's, it's interesting watching him because his, his kids stop by all the time. He's got several adult kids, and he and his wife were both married before, so she had several kids. So there's like six or eight. It seems like there's a, a ton of them always coming through. But one of the things I've always noticed is they always hug and give a kiss on the cheek before they say goodbye. And, and not, just, not just the guy that I work with with his daughters, but he does it with his sons as well. I think that's kind of interesting. They're, uh, they're, they're a loving family in that way. Now, I think my family's loving too, and we don't, you know, Whitney stops and visits me sometimes, and I don't usually give her a hug and a kiss there either. Maybe we should start, though, you think? But, uh, but no, at any rate, you'd, you'd get that impression. Uh, would someone walk away thinking, well, maybe uh, you're an up north woodsy type of a family? Would they get that? You know, maybe they'd come into your house and see your decorations, something like that. Would they think you were tidy, or would they think you were unkempt? Okay. It depends. Uh, Jill, were you gone for a week and he was here by himself? I don't know if that makes a difference or not. I'm not sure. Um, what about, uh, do they think that you're, maybe, forget the tidiness or unkemptness, do they think that maybe your family is all about relationships as opposed to necessarily just how clean the house is? Some of the most welcoming, nice, loving people that I've known, their houses are not what you would call tidy and, and, and well kept, but it doesn't matter because they're about the relationships. So that's, that's a possibility. Would they think you were ambitious or would they think you were more sedentary? Uh, I don't know. Oh, who knows? Now, rever or not reverse that, but take it into a different direction. Instead of you and your family, what if someone stopped by and met us here as a church? What would they think about us? What kind of things would stand out about us as a church? I I've, I've been able to talk to a few people that have visited, and, and they've given me their impression a couple times. Now, there's a lot of people that I haven't gotten their impression from. It'd be kind of neat to do an exit interview each time, I suppose, and see exactly what they think. But uh, what, what would they actually think about us? Our church. What kind of a of a reputation would we, or not reputation, I guess, but persona would we put forth? What would they think about that? Well, that's that's an interesting thought. Today we're going to start a new series on the book of First Thessalonians, and we're going to look at the Thessalonian church. So today I want us to meet the Thessalonians, and I think Paul's going to tell us some things about them here in chapter one. So we're going to begin by meeting the Thessalonians. But in order to do that. We really need to go back to the book of Acts where it all started. We're going to look at their, at their beginning and how their story got started. As we get ready to do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for bringing us together today. I pray that you would uh, uh, help us to be able to think through these issues, help us to be able to set aside the cares of the morning. Maybe that curling iron broke or something and, and, and we're agitated. I just pray that you'd help us to set those things aside and uh, to be able to think of these. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would be active and you would encourage us today through these things. Lord, bless those of our number who aren't here today. Uh, they've got different things going on. I know uh, Deb Quackenbush just had uh, another surgery for melanoma and, and is not quite up to par today. I pray that you would uh, bless her, uh, give her strength and, and uh, help Bill as he cares for her as well. And, and Lord, the others that are doing different things, just encourage them today, Father, as they try to walk with you. Now, Lord, bless our time. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first of all, let's look at their story. And I'm going to go back into Acts chapter 17. But even before Acts chapter 17, there's a couple of things to remember. I know we just went over these a few weeks ago. But remember, Paul was on his second missionary journey, and they were up in Asia Minor, and they were trying to go uh, to the right, and then they tried to go to the left. And uh, I just did that backwards. Did you notice that? I, I, uh, sorry. If I say go left... 
go left, don't go, or go the way I'm pointing, don't listen to what I actually say. But, but Paul was trying to go both ways and it didn't work, so they just kind of went straight. And then Paul had that Macedonian call vision, that dream, remember, where a person from Macedonia is saying, come on over and help us. So Paul and his group did. They got on a boat, they went across, and they got into Macedonia, which put them in Europe, the first official missions trip into Europe. And the first thing they did was they went to Philippi. You remember there were some struggles there. Uh, that's, they, they led Lydia and her family to the Lord. And then they got uh, in trouble and they were beaten and they were thrown in jail. And then they led the Philippian jailer and his uh, household to the Lord. And then they ended up leaving after that. And they went on and they made their way to Thessalonica. But remember, Paul's getting there after just receiving a pretty severe beating. And now they're, they're showing up in Thessalonica a few days into this trip. And that gets me up to chapter 17. And I want to go ahead and read this. I want to begin at verse 1. It says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But as the Jews were who were not persuaded, I'm sorry, but the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And as the story goes on, they weren't there. They made Jason and a few other believers uh, pay some sort of a security deposit. Uh, guaranteeing that this, this kind of stuff wouldn't keep going on, and then they let him go. But there was some persecution. And then Paul left, and they went on down to the next town. But there's a couple things I want to point out from there. First of all, what was Paul's message while he was there with the Thessalonians? Remember, this is a new group. Uh, there doesn't appear to be any believers there in that town. There were what we would call Old Testament believers. There were people in the synagogues who worshipped the God of the Old Testament. And, and some of those, the, the genuine ones, I would say, they turned to the Lord. And then there were some Gentiles that were in the synagogue as well. They would be what we would call God-fearers. Some of them turned to the Lord as well. So we see some of that going on. But it's a brand new group. A brand new church, and Paul's trying to minister to them. What was his message? And you see that in verse 3 of chapter 17. He says he was explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Now you've got to read between the lines. There's a lot else going on, because they were in the synagogue, so these people understood the Old Testament scriptures. They understood the prophecies about the Messiah. They understood that God was promising to send this Messiah that not only would be Israel's Messiah, but would be the Savior of the whole world. That's the message that Paul was preaching, and he was letting them know that we now know who he is. It's Jesus Christ. And so that's how, how his message gets going. Uh, it mentions in verse 4 of chapter 17, there, there were a number of these folks that got saved. A few Jews, but a bunch of Greeks, and then some leading women as well. Now, I did some reading this week on, on that phrase, leading women, and a lot of the commentators that I read seem to think that what, what was happening is, is there were important people in the city, like important men in powerful positions, and apparently these were some of their wives. So now it's really hitting home because now uh, not just the normal people in the city were, were being influenced by the gospel, but now the leadership of the city is being influenced by the gospel as well. So it, it was making an impact. How long was Paul there? How long was he in Thessalonica? Well, if you look at verse 2, it says that he went into the, to the, on the Sabbath into the synagogue and reasoned with them on three different Sabbaths. So we know he was there at least three weeks, but... There's more, there's more to it than that. He was in the Sabbath for three weeks, but it appears that he was there at least a little bit longer because of some of the things that he ended up doing with the church that we, we get from evidence from his letters and other things like that. But he wasn't there long. He was there, at the least he was there about a month. But probably he was there anywhere from two to six months, somewhere in that time frame. He only spent three weeks of that in the synagogue. But there were a lot of people that ended up getting saved. And it was long enough for them to stir up the Jews and get the Jews upset at them. And then they created this mob scene and chased them out of town. So they were there for a little while. But here's my question. 
And this is why I wanted us to go and look at the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians and probably 2 Thessalonians after that. What did Paul teach them in the time that he was there? Back when I was studying that portion of Acts and and I was preaching on it, uh, the day I read through that he was at the Thessalonians, I, I went and read the letter, the first letter he wrote. And the reason I went and read that is, is he wrote that just a couple months later. Because remember from Thessalonica, he went to Berea for a short time, and then he went to to Athens for a short time, and then he went to Corinth, and he was at Corinth for about a year and a half. And while he was at Corinth is when he wrote the letter to the Thessalonicans. So he had only been there anywhere from six months to a year, year and a half before that, and now he's writing a letter. What interests me about that is is this letter is going to tell me what was on their mind. You know what I mean? You know, it's like if you've got a friend and you just spent a week with them and you come back and write a letter to them, your letter is going to reflect some of the things that you guys talked about when you were together for that week. If you wait and write it 10 years later, it's going to reflect other information. But this was a, a, a soon letter after Paul had been with them. And what, what did he say? I think this letter is going to teach us some things about what was on their mind. It's going to also teach us some things about when Paul goes in and starts a church, what are some of the most important things that he wants to get across to them right away? Because remember, most of these people, they they didn't come from Christian backgrounds. They weren't raised in Christian homes. So this whole Christianity thing was new to them. So what things did Paul talk to them about? What things were on their mind? What things were on his mind? Now, to be fair, it wasn't just Paul. Remember, Paul was part of a team, and he had Timothy here as well. We're going to see later in in 1 Thessalonians that Paul sent Timothy back. When he moved on to to Athens and then to Corinth, he got a little concerned about what's going on with the Thessalonians because they were such a new group. So he sent Timothy back, and according to the passage, he sent him back to encourage them in their faith. So Timothy went back and continued doing some teaching. And, and bringing them on, some discipleship, if you want to say it that way. And then Timothy came back to Paul, gave a report to him. By the way, this is all in chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. He reported to Paul what all was going on, and Paul was super encouraged. Because apparently things were going very well. Apparently these people were growing in the Lord. Apparently these people were thinking spiritually and so forth. And so that's why Paul decided to write this letter. But when he sent it, you, you would think the things he's going to be most concerned with, first of all, are the basics. What are the basics? And I think this letter is going to represent some basics. And I'm hoping it will encourage each one of us. Because don't you ever sometimes get confused with all the information that's out there, all of the Christian information that's out there. Uh, you've got all these people who have built upon teaching, upon teaching, upon teaching. And some of it can seem so confusing and so, uh, you know, like you think about a, a seminary. You, you can go to a seminary and learn stuff that's really high up there as far as, as deep intellectual stuff. And sometimes that gets beyond us. I, sometimes I want to think, wait a minute, what are the basics? What things should I be most concerned with in my Christian life? Right, right at the beginning, when I'm just talking about me as a Christian and how I'm living my Christian life, what are the basics that are going to help me the most? I think that's what Paul does here in 1 Thessalonians. And, and I must admit, I'm excited about looking into uh, the rest of this letter because there are a number of things that he talks about. I'll also tell you this, it surprised me one or two of the things that they talked about that I would have thought maybe would be later on teachings, but no, they were things they were thinking about. Right from the beginning. Well, with that said, let's go and look at the Thessalonians in chapter 1. And what we're going to see here is Paul's going to mention their spiritual state. What did he think about their spiritual state and what things did he say to them? I'm in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. It says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. By the way, Silvanus is Silas. It's just another way of saying his name. To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, or beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believed. 
For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Well, let's take all that and kind of put it together. Here's what I think Paul did in the first chapter. When you see, maybe you noticed that there was a little a thing that you would call like a, 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 triplic, a triplicate thing happening here in verse 2 and 3, where he says, I remember your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope. I think what Paul did was he mentioned those three things first, and then in the rest of the chapter, he's going to illustrate what he means by those. What do I mean by your work of faith? What do I mean by your labor of love? What do I mean by your patience of hope? And he actually points those things out to him. So, so we're going to look at those things as we go. But before we do that, there were a couple statements in there that I just want to talk about for a moment. First of all, Paul said that God's power was evident when we were there. Uh, look at verse 5. He says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, first of all, he says, you guys didn't change. You guys didn't become what you are because we were such great preachers or because we were such great teachers or because we had our ministry team divided up in such a way that, that we got all these things figured out. No, what we were doing was we were just delivering the words. But something more had to happen, and it was God that caused something more to happen. Because he says here, those words came in power. And I believe that that's God's power. God was active. God's the one that was going to change any lives that were going to be changed. Especially when you look at the fact that they suffered persecution right away. Remember Jason and a number of the others that got hauled down to the magistrates and then they got in trouble because of this? They were facing persecution right off the bat. And yet God still changed their lives. They were still changing. And he did it through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was the one who was specifically there enacting all of these things. And then Paul also says, he says, and it was in much assurance. That, that word assurance could also have been translated much confidence. And what he goes on to say is because you guys saw what type of people we were. They could tell that Paul and his companions were not just some traveling band coming through trying to make some money. Hey, let's raise up a group. Let's take some offerings. We'll make some money and then we can move on. That had nothing to do with it. In fact, Paul was a tent maker at the time and he was still doing his trade. And, and so he was earning his way. We'll find that later as you see uh, just his whole testimony unfolding. They weren't doing it to try to get money. They weren't even doing it necessarily to try to raise up a group so that they would look good that they have a bunch of followers. But instead, God was at work. God's power was evident. And then he also said this at the end of verse 4, right after he talked about those three things, your work of faith, labor, love, patience of hope. He says in verse 4, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. That's an important phrase. Sometimes we can bypass that phrase as we're looking at other things in this particular chapter. But what Paul is saying is this. I know because of the things that I have witnessed that you guys are saved. You guys are believers in Jesus Christ. By the way, you know what the phrase saved means. You're saved from the wrath to come. You're saved from hell. We've been saved from the penalty that was put upon the human race ever since Adam and Eve sinned. We're saved from that. That's what saved me. And Paul says, ever since you turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, turned to his gospel, I can tell that you are true believers because of the things that I see. I can see that. And he mentioned specifically the word election. And what he's talking about here, election, is that God elected you. God chose you you. I can tell that you truly are one of the elect, that you are one of those that God chose. Well, well, what exactly uh, does that word election mean? Uh, again, it means that God chose you, but you've got to think about it from this standpoint, because we all want to look at how we're involved when it comes to salvation. And no, no, I chose God. Well, you need to look at it from this perspective. From the human perspective, yes, we chose God. But from the divine perspective, if you could go behind the scenes and open the curtains to see what was really going on, and someday maybe we'll get to do this, you can pull back the curtains and see exactly what God was doing to cause you to want to choose him. Romans, Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says that no one seeks after God. Left to our own self, let me put it this way, left to your free will, you would freely choose to go away from God. 
And that, that's what the scriptures teach in, in Romans chapter 3. But God wasn't going to have that. Instead, God said, I'm not going to let them all choose to walk away from me. I'm going to cause some of them to turn to me. And that's what we refer to as election. The scriptures say that God elected us before eternity ever, ever began. He decided who he was going to choose. I know that it brings up all kinds of other ideas, all kinds of other thoughts, and, but we'll see some of that unfold as we study the scriptures more. But God caused you to turn to him. What Paul is getting at here, rather than trying to get into a big theological discussion about it, is Paul's trying to say, I can tell that you're one of those God chosen. I can tell that you are genuinely saved. And that brought up a question for me to talk about. How do you know if someone truly is saved? How do you know if they're truly of the elect, if you want to look at it from that perspective? And the answer, part of the answer is this, you can't until after they're saved. So some people could argue, in fact, some people blame uh, uh, Calvinists being extreme Calvinists of saying, well, we don't need to witness. In fact, they did this once to a missionary. If God wants to save the heathens, he'll do it without your help. Well, that's not true. Yeah, I mean, God's going to save who he's going to save, but God's going to do it through our efforts and through our work. So we need to go and, and, and be involved in working, be invo involved in witnessing. But how do you know who the saved are? If only we could figure out who the saved are, we could cut our time down, right? And just witness to them? No, that's, that's crazy. We, got, we have to witness to everybody. We have to go and talk to everybody. I, I helped an evangelist one time out in Binghamton, New York. And, and he, what he said this, he said, the gospel, the gospel is like dynamite. It's the power of God, the dunamis of God. And he said, but it doesn't just save. The gospel condemns as well. Yes, people hear the gospel and they respond to it and they turn to God for salvation. But others hear the gospel and they reject it and refuse it and they turn unto damnation. So the gospel does both. So, so when it comes to how do you know who the saved are, we don't know who they are. We just have to talk to everybody about it. We have to spread the message to everyone. But once people make a decision to turn to the Lord for salvation or at least claim that they do... Again, how do you know that they truly are saved? The only way you're going to know is by observing their life. You watch their life. If someone gives you an apple tree, you go home and plant it, and next year you get pears on it, guess what? They didn't give you an apple tree. They gave you a pear tree. You know it by its fruit. You know it by the things that are coming from its life. Okay? The same thing is true, by the way. People are watching you. People are watching me. And what fruit are they seeing produced from your life? That, that's how they're going to know whether you are or whether you aren't. That's just, that's just the way of things. But Paul is saying here, I can see the fruit in you. I thought you're an apple tree. I see apples coming from you. I know you're an apple tree. I thought you were a Christian. You claim to be a Christian. I see real things of faith coming from you. Therefore, I can see it. I can see this election. So what, what evidence does he give in their lives uh, showing that they are, in fact, genuine? Uh, we, again, we get this threefold thing in verse 3. He says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope. Now, I want to look at those three things, and then I want to go into the rest of the, the chapter, especially verses 6 through 10, and see where I think so many of those things plug in to help define a little more what he meant. Well, first of all, let's look at this idea of he's remembering their work of faith. Well, how would you define a work of faith? Well, the definition of a work of faith is things that are evident in your life because of your faith. By the way, it's not work you do in order to have faith. Or it's not work you do in order to enter the faith, but rather it's because you have faith, there's certain things that you do. Because you have faith, your life is reflecting a certain part of that. Your, your life's reflecting that faith, and we can see it. And that's what Paul's saying that he saw in them. Let me give you an example. Go to verse 6. He says, and you became followers of us and of the Lord. So the first thing you notice is they became followers. Yes, they became followers of, of Paul. That makes sense because Paul and his team, they were the ones preaching. Think about it. The Thessalonians were third generation Christians, if you want to put it that way. Jesus started it all. And then Paul got saved and by his interaction with the Lord Jesus. And then they got saved through Paul's ministry. They are third generation Christians. Boy, I wonder what generation uh, each one of us would be. Wouldn't it be neat if you could go back and trace your family tree to see uh, who, who was it that the Lord used to bring you to, to Christ, and then who brought them, and then who brought them before them, and go all the way back. I wonder how many generations. 
we are. It, it, it's hard, hard to say. But they were third generation Christians. And they were followers of Paul because of that. Sure, they were, they were loyal to Paul and loyal to some of the other ministers that ministered to them. That just kind of makes sense. But if that's where it stayed, that wouldn't be deep enough. Paul went on to say, not only were you followers of us, but you became followers of the Lord. And I think that's where their Christianity took a deeper step. It's not about following these leaders, per se. It's about following the Lord. And that's what they did. They began following the Lord. It, it was now a relationship with God. It wasn't just that they had this guy who was, a, who was a brave speaker willing to stand up in the midst of getting stoned or beaten or all the other things that happened to him. That wasn't good enough. Well, but they became followers of the Lord. They, they knew the Lord Jesus Christ. They had a personal relationship with him. And also, as far as this work of faith, something that oozes from them because of their faith, he said, uh, you did these things with joy of the Holy Spirit. Or let me go back. He says, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. They, they were having troubles right off the very bat. But in spite of those troubles, their joy was evident. They had what we call the joy of the Lord. It was the joy of the Holy Spirit. It came through the Holy Spirit. The joy of the Lord. And it was, it was obvious in spite of the mob problems that they were having there as far as the, 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 the unruly mob that was, that was trying to attack them and Paul. And because of the threats. I mean, what kind of threats did they give Jason and the other believers when they took security from them to promise them? It probably was pretty dire. And yet they still continued on with the Lord. And they didn't just continue on with the Lord as his followers, but they did it with joy. They were grateful. Now, just stop and think about this for a minute in your own life. Do you remember when you turned to the Lord for salvation? I can remember it plain as day. In fact, it was during the week of July 4th, 1980, when I turned to the Lord for salvation. I had been raised in a Christian family, but my faith wasn't, wasn't genuine up until then. I knew a lot of facts, but it wasn't genuine. But during that week of July 4th, 1980, I was up camping in the Adirondack Mountains in New York with, with a Christian youth ministry there, and that's where I turned to the Lord. And I remember when I came home from that, there was joy. I mean, I was one happy guy. I can remember walking down the street. We lived in an old town, one of those old towns with sidewalks and the big elm trees and all that. It's just kind of picturesque like that. And I remember walking down the street, and I felt like I was maybe 10 feet up in the air. I can remember that my mind was just consumed with things of the Lord as I was thinking about all these new things. By the way, another evidence that, that, that I believe that's when the Lord made my salvation genuine is my mind was truly geared towards spiritual things. And uh, not, that I, not that I didn't sin anymore. I still sin, but I went right to the Lord right away and, and tried to confess those things to Him. But I, I remember it being such a happy time. And then other periods throughout my life, I've had happy times. Now, I've also had... Hard times, sad times. But I have to admit, I, I think that my life as a believer has been more, far more joyful than sad. Even when you think of some of the, some of the more difficult things that you have to go through. A lot more joy. And, and you need to ask yourself, what about your Christian experiences since you turned to the Lord? Is it more characterized by joy being happy in the Lord? Or is it more characterized by doom and gloom and, and all the other difficulties in life around you? I think if that's the case, you need to check your faith and check and see. Paul was saying, I mean, the work of faith, the things in your life I can see that demonstrate your faith is that you follow the Lord and I can see joy evident in your life. It was very much apparent there. It's one of those things that's hard to explain, isn't it? Hard, hard to explain. If someone asked you, what exactly is the joy of the Lord? How would you put that into words? Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I find myself just happy and I don't know why. Have you ever had that? Have you ever woke up some mornings and just realized, oh, what a beautiful day? And you haven't looked out the window yet. How do you know? Uh, I, I don't know. Have you, have you ever had times where you're, just, you're going along and you just realize, wow, I'm happy? Some people like to, like to live in their, in their downtrodden state. I, I wouldn't want to do that. But we need to learn how to enjoy the joy of the Lord. And they were certainly doing that. It was an evidence of the work of faith that was in their life. Well, let me move on. Paul then goes on and he talks about their labor of love. Well, how would I define labor of love? What, how I would define it is it's a new priority in your life. You have new priorities now uh, because you now love the Lord 
And I think because you love the Lord, you also love people. And so it's going to create uh, new things. There's new endeavors. There's new things that are important to you as opposed to what you might have uh, had before. You now, and especially in the Thessalonians case, uh, you want to serve God by showing your faith to others. See, that's the way that, that they were showing their love to others is they became witnesses. They, 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 they became ones who showed forth the gospel. Why? They were surrounded by a world full of people who were dying and going to hell. And they were involved in the process of some of those people getting saved and turning to God. That's how they, they showed their love. I find it interesting that it doesn't say exactly how they showed their love. I mean, what types of things they did to demonstrate that love. I suppose it could be as wide as any of our imaginations are, and all the types of things you could do to show people the love of the Lord and to, to show people that, that the gospel's true and they need a Savior as well. But, but they did those things. He says in verse 7, he says that, uh, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia, excuse me, in Macedonia and Achaia who believed. They became examples. They became examples of people that God changed. God did a work in their lives. They turned to Jesus for salvation. And God did a work in their lives and they became examples. People could see it. By the way, Macedonia was the state they lived in. Uh, they were from Thessalonica. That was their city. And the, the evidence is that, that surely they had an impact in their city. Macedonia was their state. And then when you get to Achaia, a that was the neighboring state next to them. And, and they, were, they were having an impact. People were hearing about it. Other believers were hearing about it. We, we'll even see it in some of, other, some of Paul's other letters where he mentions their faith that other people heard about it and knew about it. And, and it was like, wow, it was impressing people. Not that they were so impressive, but God was impressive in what he was doing in them and through them. And so you certainly saw that. They became an example. And then Paul says this in verse 8. Interesting word. He said, for from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. That word for sounded, some, maybe your translation has a different word there because that word actually means to reverberate. Or if you wanted to say, it, it, you could say reflect. The idea here seems to be that Paul and his group came in and they preached the gospel. The gospel hit on the Thessalonians and then shone forth to everybody else. It's kind of like you taking a light. Hey, have you ever wondered how you can make your flashlight shine around a corner? Well, put a mirror up there. And you shine your light into the mirror and it goes around to the corner where you're not at, but the light's still shining up there. That's the idea with the Thessalonians. It was, it was sounding forth from them. People were seeing what was going on with them. And it was making an impact. It, it gives the impression that, yes, they, they were involved in talking about their faith and talking about the gospel. But even more than that, they were showing forth their faith. People could actually see that God was, in fact, working in their lives. This wasn't some group dealing with a theoretical idea. It was something that was actually happening in their lives, and they could see that. Here's something I found that was interesting in verse 8. You can see it says, uh, uh, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out. Think about this for a minute. Uh, they obviously are making an impact in their city, in uh, Thessalonia, but then they are, they are making an impact on their, their fellow countrymen in Macedonia and on other countrymen even beyond that in Achaia. And now they're making an impact even beyond that. Paul says everywhere that the message goes. So it's spreading out even farther than that. Does that remind you of any other Bible verse you can think of? We studied it back in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus told the disciples, and these are the disciples who made up the first church in Jerusalem. He said, after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, their city, in Judea and Samaria, their, their, their country and the country next door, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's exactly what the Thessalonians were doing. They were having an impact not only on their neighbors and on their fellow statesmen, but their fellow countrymen, and even beyond that into the rest of the world. They were actually having an impact. Paul said that's part of your labor of love. You, 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 you're going to, because of your new priorities, you now have a love for God and a love for others. And it's going to cause you to have an outreach. It's going to cause you to have a witness farther than that. And then he says there's also proof that you've been saved. All these things prove that your salvation is genuine. Look at verse 9. He says, for they, meaning these things that you've done to cause your testimony to go all over the place, for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. In other words, they proved that our ministry was successful. That's basically what Paul is saying. And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. 
Here are people that they turned from these idols. They were religious before this, but it was, it was in falseness. It was in, in, in their case, it was idolatry. They turned from that, and they turned to God, and they served the living and the true God. And that's what people could see. People could see that their salvation was genuine. And that was their labor of love. That was their motivation. Their motivation appeared to be that they wanted to be witnesses because other people needed what we've got. Not that we're so great, but that one beggar can show another beggar where to find bread. And that's what we're doing. And that's what the Thessalonians apparently were doing. Made me ask this question to myself and, and to you as well. Uh, what was motivating your life before you met Christ? What was driving you? I don't know if you've even really sat down and thought about that. I, 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 would, I would need to sit down and really, if I want to think that through on a deeper level, what motivated me? What kept me going? What were my, what were my true goals? I mean, if you ask me my goals, I might not list them this way, but if you looked into my life and what I was striving for and what kept me going, what pushed me forward, what, what motivated me, what, what would those things be? And, and for all of us, the answers would be different. Uh, maybe we were after pleasure. Maybe we thought the goal in life was for us to have fun. I mean, doesn't, the, doesn't our Constitution even say that? The pursuit of happiness? And, and we all certainly want to pursue happiness. But, but maybe that was the driving force in our life. That was what we would call an idol of the heart. Uh, one of the New Testament prophets, our Old Testament prophets, talk about that when he mentions idols of the heart. You might not be serving a stone statue or a wooden statue, but you've got some concept in your heart that that's what you're serving, that concept. And so everything you do, everything you're attempting, the things that you're pushing at are aiming at fulfilling that concept and serving that concept. That's an idol of the heart. Maybe it was pleasure. Uh, maybe it was materialism or money. Uh, maybe it was sports. Maybe it was pride and reputation. You know, I, I want everyone to look at me this way. And, and I want to have this reputation or whatever. Um, maybe it was a power. Maybe it was greed. Boy, we see that, don't we? We see all these things in our world. But can other people see that you have turned from serving those things to serving God? Or did you just slap a Bible verse on it and you're still serving all those concepts? But now you've got Bible verses to at least... Uh, sanitize it all, right? Uh, we have to be careful about that. Did I turn from the idols in my heart to serve the living and true God? Or am I still grasping for all those other things? By the way, all those other things are what leads to the problems in our lives, aren't they? And when, when we can't get the things that we want, it just really, really hurts us. I, I remember doing a study on, on children who end up being angry. I was reading a study on children who, who are angry. And the funny thing is, is the typical child who becomes an angry child and then becomes an angry adult, the typical child tends to be one of the younger children in the family who the rest of the family catered to. You know, that child wanted the toy and was yelling and screaming, and mom would tell the older son, oh, just give it to him. Oh, well, they give it to him. Uh, the other child wanted his way, mom and dad would give him his way. And, and they're making the older kids maybe do chores around the house and, and work. By the way, I was the youngest child. I used to like it when mom and dad made the older kids do the work and I got out of it because I was too young to do those things, right? Uh, you, you, you know? But, but the, the funny thing is, is what the study concluded is those are the kids that tend to be the most angry. Why? They get out of that cocoon that they're in and the rest of the world's not catering to them that way. Now, when they yell and scream because they want a toy, someone's not there telling the other playmate to just give them the toy because that playmate's going to hang on to it. Uh, now, when they get into school, uh, the teachers aren't, aren't being soft on them on everything, and, and they're struggling with it. And, and they get into work, and the boss won't cater to them. The boss doesn't understand why he needs three days a week out sick. You know? uh, and so pretty soon he loses the job. Well, well you, you get this person who can end up being an angry person because they're not getting their way. And a lot of those things. Uh, that is an idol of their heart. That mom and dad unwittingly helped develop in them. And so they have to be careful. But when you become a believer, can people see that you have turned from those idols to serve the living and true God? Paul could see it in the Thessalonians. He could see it. It was proof in his eyes that uh, they were, in fact, genuine followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the next thing Paul mentions, and I will make this quick because we're going to talk about this a lot later, is Paul mentions your patience of hope. 
What does it mean by patience of hope? By the way, that word patience, when you go and look at it, uh, when you look at the, the meaning of the specific Greek word, it has to do with endurance and being able to endure. So what Paul is saying here, I, I can see in you that you guys are able to endure because you've got this hope. You've got something that you're waiting for, something that you're looking for. Um, and in this case, you can endure now because you know Jesus is coming back. You see, even in those days... They were expecting Jesus to return at any time. It's not just something that we now would look for. They expected Jesus to return at any time. And they didn't have all of the, all of the uh, theology behind it. I don't know that they would say, like we would at our church, that they're premillennial and, and pre-tribulational and all that stuff. Uh, they might not know all those things, but they were waiting for Jesus to return. And, and, and that was an important thing. And because of that, they could endure the things that they were going through. Because they were waiting for him to return. And how do you know that? Well, he says patience to hope there, but then go over to verse 10. He says, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. They were waiting for Jesus to come back. They were waiting because why? Well, what is that wrath that they're talking about? You, we could look at it a lot of different ways. I mean, we as pre-tribulationists would look at the wrath that God will pour out during the tribulation. But even if you want to go beyond that, just the wrath that waits eternity. Those people who are in Jesus Christ, those people who have the gift of eternal life, they're going to forever be with God and forever experience his blessings. But those people who don't will forever experience the wrath of God in a place we would call hell. So they were waiting for Jesus to return. They believe that. Here, here's an interesting part of all that. If you go and look at the end of every chapter in 1 Thessalonians, Paul mentions Jesus returning. Now this was a surprise to me that such a new group would be talking about uh, prophecy, if you will, in this case. But they were waiting. He mentions it there in uh, chapter 1, verse 10, that, that he's coming. He mentions it in chapter 2, verse 19, talking about the Lord re returning. He mentions it in chapter 3, verse 13. In chapter 4, he talks about the whole thing uh, in the last four or five verses of that chapter. And then in chapter 5, he actually talks about it a lot. But right at the end of the chapter, he mentions again that they're waiting for the Lord to return. The Thessalonians were able to endure whatever it was they were going through. Because Jesus is coming. Jesus will be back. We will be able to be with him. They were able to endure. So you see their faith. You, you, Paul, saw, Paul saw their faith. He saw their, their work of faith. That, uh, that there were things evident in their life because of their faith. He saw their labor of love. The things they did because they loved God and they loved their neighbors. And then he saw their patience of hope. They were able to endure because they, they knew... That Jesus was coming back. They could see that. Well, the question is, is, what if someone met us here at our church? What if they met the HBCers? What if they went back and wrote a letter like this that, that Paul wrote? Would they be able to say things like that about us? And even more importantly than that, forget us as an organization. Would they be able to say that about you? Would they be able to say that about me? Would your life reflect those things? Would you be able to add to or contribute to the testimony of, of our group? Because it's evident that you have this faith, this love, and this hope. Well, it begins with salvation. First of all, is your salvation genuine? Are you truly trusting in Jesus alone for your eternal life? And if you are, then the Holy Spirit will come inside you and he'll work in you. And if you'll cooperate with him, he'll do great things in your life. And, and, and we need to do that as we, as we try to show forth our faith and be this testimony like this brand new church was. Their testimony was spreading throughout the world at that time. We can do the same thing. You can do the same thing as we walk with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to see this group of believers, this, this new group, the Thessalonians. Thank you for allowing us to see how they had so quickly followed you and they had so quickly shown evidence in their lives of their genuine salvation. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to show those same things. Help us, Lord, to uh, show forth uh, our faith, to, to have things, have our faith be real so that it will be evident to those watching. Help us, Lord, to, to have the love of the Lord, uh, the, the love of, of, of following you and, and helping those who, who need to see you. And uh, Father, as we wait for the Lord Jesus, I pray that you encourage us. We do look forward to that day uh, when he will take us home to be with him. Thank you, Father. Uh, help us, Lord, to 
live out our faith in a meaningful way that would uh, reverberate to the world around us. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen.